Greetings, my name is uh, Duncan Stewart. I'm actually uh, uh, communicating to you from New Zealand, sunny New Zealand. While the rest of you freeze, we're having basking weather. Uh, guys, could you turn the air conditioning uh, down a bit? Thanks. Um, look, today I wanted to do a quick framing discussion about neural networks. What, what I've chosen to do is really zoom in on a fairly narrow topic, um, a, a, a micro topic, but I wanted to use it to illustrate um, e in even small things how we can move forward as researchers, how we can extend our repertoire of what we do and our usefulness to the world around us. So what I wanted to do was talk briefly about neural networks, give you a couple of superly disguised examples of how we've used them, and tell you how we got to a simple concept called bump. It's just, it's too ridiculously simple, but it actually reflects a, a, a lot of kind of deep um, uh, technology behind it. Um, I'll then talk about the significance and applicability of bump index, and then take your questions. Now, the first question, really is how does this presentation fit in with new market research? What is the connection between Duncan's bizarre little sandpit you know, bump experiments and the whole world of new MR? Well, I wanted to show you first of all this chart which we put together and I, I frankly don't think, you know, we've put our names on top of it, but frankly I, I think there are many variations of the same chart. Uh, effectively, it's a kind of like what gives us value in research, and effectively our values or the value we deliver comes from two things. On the horizontal axis is the question is how deep? It sounds like a Bee Gees song. How deep is your love? How deep is the analysis? And our analytics collectively are either descriptive or there's deeper analysis, or we get into the world of modelling, though very seldom. Uh, the other value, the other part of the value equation for research is really the client side. How is the research used? What sort of uh, decisions are made as the result of the research? And if you look at the, um, if you, if you look at the bottom left of the graph, what you get into is a kind of zone of simple research, where what we're doing is I don't know, we might be monitoring a brand, and our marketing you know, marketing manager uh, client is really saying, well, you know, how did our brand do? And we, we, we come back with the numbers and say, yep, you didn't sell too many last Christmas. Um, I, I find that very sort of uh, low value research. I mean, they honestly, they could have gone to their warehouse and learned that they didn't sell that many that Christmas. So we haven't added much value to the, the process of, of, of marketing where the research really isn't delivering whole new opportunities for the client. Um, old EMR basically lives, however, in that quadrant. It's delivering descriptive research, you know, with its cross tabs, its pies, its bars, etc. And our clients are really, to a large extent, not using us in a particularly challenging way. They're wanting to see how the brand is doing, or they're wanting to measure the effectiveness, or they want us to, you know, how are we doing in, in our customer service, and they're kind of measuring and looking for clues at how they might move forward, but it's fairly low calorie stuff. That is old MR. Um, now the value frontier, that the, those sort of circles, and it, it, what we should be doing is trying to move that upwards to the right. Well, I don't think we should be. I mean, it's not because there's a moral obligation. I just think it's an opportunity that we can be moving up to the right. There's plenty of money still, I'm sure, plenty of business in that bottom left quadrant. But as people move to Survey Monkey and they move to Zoomerang and they start doing things internally and there are processes which kind of replace what researchers used to do with a, you know, a calculator, um, we, we have, we've got to look for new territory. So hence our move up into the top right. Now, what is the world of the top right looking like? Well, it's about pushing that frontier further. Anyone who, with Monkey or email or Excel can do most of the things in the red square in the bottom left. But new MR is about really pushing our, our 
analytical technologies further. We, we for, you know, forget about description, forget about sort of basic analysis. What about this world of modeling where we could take today's data and use that as, a, as Lego to start creating future models? What would, what would the future look like if we did this or if we did that? Now, new market research is about using that technology and really pushing it a bit further. We go from what is tech research, the what is happening to your brand, what is happening to your customer service. We're moving into what if. Now the world of modeling is not a world that we, we all regularly walk around in. I think, I'm sure some of you do, and, and, and those people who do are listening and are going to you know, throw rocks at me and go, oh come on Duncan, we've been doing this for years. The reality is that a lot of the technology you can use for modeling has been around for years. Um, uses certain assumptions that our clients usually find a bit sticky. Uh, frankly, when I've done, um, you know, done exercises and gone to a client and gone, hey, we've been able to model this and look at your future and how about that, a lot of clients kind of, kind of rear backwards. They, they, they go, ooh, this all looks a bit, it's really not a pie chart, is it? It's not a cross tab. It's, I'm getting a bit uncomfortable here. Now, why that discomfort is, Modeling acknowledges the world is a complex place. It, it really, good modeling is, doesn't assume that consumers respond en masse in the same direction. In other words, tools we use in classic things like regression curves where if we dial up X then revenue goes up by Y. Really a lot of that is linear. It assumes that everyone's going to kind of step forward in the same direction when the, when, when the new marketer says do this, everyone now buys the product. And of course the world's much more complicated than that. It also acknowledges that the consumer attitudes make up only part of the story. One of the, one of the myths or one of the problems we work with as market researchers is that we assume that we, we, we really just talk only within the world of what the consumer said. Now if I was selling ice cream, um, really I'd want to know also what the weather's going to do. Above a certain temperature, ice cream just goes through the roof. Um, above, if it, get, <laughs> if it goes up much higher, it then melts down onto the floor as well. But weather is a major driver of ice cream sales. So modeling for ice cream wouldn't be just what the consumer thinks, but also we'd better weave in uh, what the long range weather forecast is going to be. If it's looking like it's uh, going to be hot and sunny, then we can, we can say to our factory, quick, pump out more ice cream. Um, so there, there are variables out there that, that we don't normally employ that we ought to start employing. Also the world of modeling acknowledges that business decisions always involve risk. As soon as we say, if this happens, you ought to try that, uh, we think you should do this in the future, inevitably we are talking about risk. Anything could happen tomorrow, 9-11 could happen, I'm Pepsi and I'm going to launch this, Coca-Cola may have similar plans that I don't know about. Now old EMR doesn't really work with those assumptions. It usually works with mean scores or simple linear regressions uh, which, which implicitly uh, treat the market as kind of homogenous. Research designs stay within the paradigm of market research. That is, we ask did you see the ad, how strongly you prefer brand C, but we don't really say uh, let's incorporate a few charts at the back about the weather or about the political situation or about the, you know, the, the changing status of, of um, a particular TV program. So we, we, we kind of leave out all those things that aren't to do with our, our survey. Uh, we are also asked to make a call, this pack or that pack, do we launch or not launch? And of course when we do a presentation and our clients sitting there folded arms and saying, well, which pack do we go with? We're expected to say A or B or C, when in fact um, it may be more complicated than that or we ought to be able to say you should go with pack A. It's the second most popular pack but it involves least downside risk. We seldom talk about risk. 
So what I'm talking about today is neural networks, which kind of busts a lot of those old uh, MR kind of ways of doing things, and as a tool challenges us to get into a kind of uh, new MR uh, mindset. Now I've got this picture here of me, uh, well not of me, but of a child in a sand pit uh, with, a, with a dump truck, and I've got to say, um, that our little office here, population two, we're a micro organisation, struggle to get projects out the door, you know, there's a little extra demand and we, we're all over the place, but we, we allow ourselves time to play with new stuff. And over the years we've played with plenty of new tools, neural networks happen to be one of them. Now, what are ne neural networks? Well, neural networks actually got invented uh, in the early 1950s. The, the problem was computers back then, this is in the golden days when IBM said there will be a market for five computers, and in fact my dad worked in one of those five places, and it was, a, you know, the, the IBM had, um, uh, it took up 2,000 square feet, they had 14 full-time engineers working on the machine, but it had a memory one seventieth of a floppy disk. That is, it could do a lot of processing, but it didn't have much memory. So, really, neural networks have bloomed in the age of the of the, the, the desktop computer. Now, they are computer emulation of the mind. Uh, they they involve a computer learning process that searches for answers through thousands, maybe even millions, of trial and error calculations. It was invented post-war. But as I say, the poor computational horsepower just rendered the whole idea of neural networks to kind of theory. But during the 70s and 80s and early 90s, neural networks became successfully applied in areas such as finance, medicine, engineering, geology, physics, really anywhere where there are problems of prediction or classification and places where there were, where there were just tons of data, too much for humans to sift through. So you go, gee, can we get a computer to kind of do the sifting, do the learning, find out what the pattern is, and then kind of make predictions. Now, a really typical example of neural networks in use is when you go to the bank in the United States, probably, you know, UK, maybe most banks in the world these days, I don't know, but certainly in the States, you go to a bank and you want to apply for a loan. Now, classically, the bank manager made the decision. He's been the, or she's been the bank manager at your branch for 27 years, knows your family, and goes, gee, Ray, you're a good risk, so we'll, we'll lend the money. Now, these days, neural network does it, partly because those managers move around every five minutes and don't know your family. Uh, secondly, they're, they're actually proving less reliable than our neural networks. Um, a neural network would take all your back data and go, oh, look at his credit history, what's your income, what's this, what's that, take a number of variables and based on its collective wisdom that has built up from bank records over the last few years and thousands and millions of calculations, it goes, Ray, you are a good risk, we'll lend the money to you. Now, I've got to put a caveat on that and say this is before the 2008 meltdown when almost everybody's mortgage kind of melted down. So uh, something catastrophic can come along and disrupt the, the model at work. But prior to then, if we, if we just exclude that as a kind of an issue, prior to then, bank managers got it wrong 12% of the time. Out of every 100 loans they, they approved, 12 of them defaulted. Neural networks get it wrong 7% of the time, 41% fewer defaults. And when you're a huge bank lending out billions of dollars, that difference makes a big difference. Now, neural networks are, I, I don't know how many of you use them. They're quite widely available and they come in various boxes and packages and and some are really easy. Uh, the first one I ever used was one called Easy NN, and it was just a, it was fabulous. It was put together by I think a Cambridge uh, mathematics um, student who was actually trying to build a system to beat the stock market or the horses. And if you read uh, 
www.gladwell.com and Malcolm Gladwell has written an article about picking hit movies and he gives a really wonderful example of, of a guy with a, a neural network beating the odds amongst a, a group of bookies in the dog racing and handily beats them thanks to neural networks. They are powerful, they're non-linear, they don't act like regressions where if this happens everyone uniformly does that. They, they look at individual cases. They can handle huge clouds of data which may be multi-dimensional where you and I can, can kind of think of a cube of data, age and gender and region and we start to kind of stretch our brains at that point. The neural network may be dealing with hundreds of variables all at once. They're very easy to use. Um, they, they learn by example, so you train the data on, you may have a spreadsheet of a thousand people and you train the neural network to kind of read and understand and analyze the data on the first 500 and then it uses the algorithms it develops to go, okay, let's look at the second 500 and see how good we are at predicting behavior. It's an iterative process, so it may have one stab at predicting and get it wrong 80% of the time, so it gives it another stab and another stab and another stab in our office, the one we use tells us how many stabs. And one recent one was 1.2 million times. There was kind of an electricity brownout in Auckland, New Zealand as our computer was running. Now, going back to that bank example, what the bank is doing is really asking you 10 simple questions. There might be things like gender, your income, how often do you max out on your credit card, do you have existing loans? Is your job full-time, part-time, unemployed? And a traditional way of analyzing this was to apply a weighting to each variable. Oh, well, oh, males are X, you know, safer than females, so we'll kind of crank up a score on this one. And Oh, high income, not low income, he gets 50 bonus points for that. And kind of work out some sort of fairly uh, mechanical algorithm based on that. So traditional analytics, you'd be really getting a very linear formula. Now credit risk is a fi fixed formula being a combo of all 10 questions. That's, that's the, the old fashioned way. You factor in this, multiply by that, add this and divide by Y and you end up with something. You end up with a very fixed formula that you apply to absolutely everyone. The problem is regular analytics are not very predictive. The reality is that some variables are hardly important at all on average, so we discount them as nearly irrelevant. For example, question 10 in my imaginary bank is, do you have a fatal disease, sir? And the reality is 99.9% .9 of us say no. So over time you might in physical land go, well, uh, we can discard that variable, it's useless, doesn't apply, you know, um, so we won't even count that, we won't even ask that question in future. The neural network might have enough data to work on to go, gee, most of the time it isn't uh, uh, an important variable unless it is. If you do have a fatal disease, suddenly this is the variable that matters most. Or some variables are conditional upon others. Do you have life insurance may be an interesting question per se, but totally irrelevant unless you answered something to do with your health condition. In other words, if you do have a fatal disease and life insurance, suddenly life insurance is a jolly useful thing to, for the bank to know. So in other words, many variables are not important unless they are. In a linear formula, regressions, correlations and those things, they don't really tell us what's going on case by case. They explain an average story but not case by case. Regular analytics also tend to simplify. They employ a few variables, life stage, credit rating, but they cannot really cope with say 80 variables which are all highly interactive. So neural networks is kind of dealing with living, breathing data. It's not treating it as a static thing. Now how do they get over this? Well, they're computer run and I'm not going to get under the hood because frankly I'd, I'd, I'd be a failure at explaining it. But they really take a range of, a good neural network program takes a range of approaches to your data. It's walking around the, the data landscape. And one metaphor I read was, was one I love is, is this one about 
my neural network robot. Now, the neural network robot has a choice of how it's going to walk around the landscape. Its mission is to find the lowest point in the landscape, the lowest, you know, the, the dead sea or the, the bit that's below sea level. Where is it? Well, how do I find it? Well, I'll, I could do it by doing little baby steps. If I just inch my way around the landscape, I may find the lowest point. But what, what would happen if you took that approach is you might land in the little red circle, which feels low. It's a little pothole. And every step you take leads you somewhere higher. So you go, well, I think I found it. I found the, lo the, the minimum, the lowest point. What you haven't done really is find out that there's a lower point somewhere else. So you go, oh, gee, maybe we should program our robot to take really big steps. So next time the robot walks around with big steps, and now this time the steps are so big, it steps right over Grand Canyon, steps right over the lowest point, and goes, no, I haven't found any low points here. So really, if that's a good metaphor for what neural network is doing, Neural network is really taking a range of step types, uh, small steps, baby steps, side steps, all kinds of different steps. To, and it, through its kind of going through the data and walking around it in different ways, we'll find that lowest point, that true minimum. And here are the three of the types. The one we use, it does you know, linear methods, radial basis function, multi-layer perceptron networks, which kind of involve, uh, if you like, a, a, a factor analysis in the middle of, of, of its calculations. And it might create unobserved variables, which then uh, drive the, the ultimate behavior of the consumer, whatever it's analyzing. I won't get into that. that. It's, it's all too complicated. And in fact, I was inspired by a disciple of John Tukey, the great statistician, who said, don't worry about what goes on under the hood. As long as you can basically drive the car, you're doing OK. Well, that's, I think, very encouraging. Now, what do the results and outputs look like? There are several outputs from a neural network. There's a ranked list of variables that have the greatest activation or effect on the output. So if I'm looking at who buys energy drinks, uh, it may be your propensity to go night clubbing is a is a is a great um, predictor, if you like, of of your 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 energy drink consumption, or do you own a car, or is your income high or low? So it's going to rank those in order of the kind of usefulness. And in fact, the neural network may well discard some of the the least useful as saying, gee, whether or not you've got a wooden leg really isn't predicting anything. So it discards the the, the wooden leg. Now, every respondent gets an activation score. So if I'm testing it on 500 uh, respondents, everyone has got a kind of an overall score out of maybe out of 100 or out of 1. And if you get a perfect score, then you are doing the thing that we are trying to predict. If we're trying to predict, do you drink energy drinks, then if you had a score of 100, then it's absolutely certain you're going to um, drink energy drinks. Um, and really, it's calibrating its scores to, to match up with the actual consumption of energy drinks. So in the next slide, I'm going to show you kind of a, a chart which illustrates this. But it leads us to what, what we inadvertently discovered, which was the bump index. Now. The energy drinks example actually was the example. I'm, I'm making up the data here, but we worked for nine years with a, a company that marketed energy drinks up against Red Bull. And I must say, Red Bull had about a third of the market share compared to our local energy drinks uh, company. They were really, uh, Red Bull are very kind of annoyed in Australasia that they're number two in the market, a, a long way number two. Now. Imagine there's a threshold score. You know, I'm looking at the red bit in the slide here. Imagine that there's a threshold score below which the neural network is saying, I don't believe you've got a score high enough to suggest you are buying energy drinks. And above the threshold score, um, say 0 0.72, 
uh, let's assume that, that that's a score that suggests you probably are buying energy drinks. As your score goes up towards 100 or up to 1, um, we're getting more and more certain that you buy energy drinks. Now we were quite excited by, at, by this, you know, this output of the neural network because we could see what components were the key drivers behind the activation score. So you could look at those with a high score or a low score and run cross tabs and find out what it was it that gave you the scores and we'll look at the list of it, you know, at the activation index and you go, gee, it's being a student gives you a higher score, getting a job actually lowers your score um, uh, and, and, and so, so on. So you could see the things driving energy drinkliness. Now at first we used that activation score as the sort of measure used with cross tabs. So it, we kind of got the neural network to do the hard stuff and then we kind of went back to our old market research ways and looked at cross tabs. But then for some reason we plotted the distribution of activation scores for all the respondents in our survey. So what we got was this kind of stretched uh, lopsided bell curve which you can now see, the green curve. And basically if you, if you got greater than 0.72, you're on the right hand side of the red line, the Berlin Wall we called it, um, you'd, you'd buy brand X and if you got less than 0.72, then you don't buy brand X or you don't buy energy drinks. Now what do you see when you look at that curve? What suddenly jumped out to us was the idea that there's a whole lot of people who live really, really close to the Berlin Wall and that they're within an ace, just a few activation points from becoming a, a customer of energy drinks. Likewise, you could say there's a whole lot of people, energy drink consumers, who live near the Berlin Wall, who just with a whiff of, you know, something that puts them off, the the the, you know, some disappointment or something, maybe they'll easily jump back over the other way, over the Berlin Wall. So this was the concept of bump. Uh, I'm sorry, it's just so simple, but bump was the idea that some people are very bumpable. That is, I can with, with a little nudge bump you over the Berlin Wall and you buy our product or with a little nudge they bump backwards. Now I, I, I kind of almost apologize for that and yet this is, you know, you're going to say, well hang on, where's the drama here? What is, is this it? Well actually it is. That activation score is a result of very sophisticated neural network technology, 1.2 million iterations and complex ways of handling data, but in the end it gave us something very simple. It gave us a sort of one single measure that says how energy drink leanness are you, what's your bump index or your activation score. Now when we look at those people inside the yellow rectangle, those people who live right next to the Berlin Wall, what we could do then is extract those people out of the data and analyze them and look at their open-enders and look at the things that motivate them and look at the, um, the things that, that might attract them to buying energy drinks. If you like, the neural network had given us, had done all the deep detective work and had given us the 200 suspects who were most bumpable and so now we were, we were seeing their motivations. So it was sort of really obvious bump. So what we're able to do really was run this on all sorts of things. We could we could now run uh, a sort of a bump index on this data or that data, and I became a bit of a office bore to, to be honest, because I was sort of running it on on everything. Like oh, there's a phone book with numbers. Let's run it on that. So it's kind of running bump in, in indices all over the place. What we found was that. Um, some um, bell curves of bump, if you like, uh, have quite different shapes. So for example, I've plotted, I've made up this one, this blue line, and, and to show that it really, uh, that population is a very low uh, bump index. The grand sort of mass of people live a long way from the Berlin Wall. So if you, if you spent just a little bit of effort motivating these people, you might inch them towards the wall, but they're certainly not going to jump over in your direction. So 
a zillion dollar campaign really won't convert them. So what we're talking about is something very simple, the idea of how convertible are people from one mode of behavior into another mode. What we're doing is saying, gee, this is, you know, this is ridiculous. We can, we can just see whether the market is fundamentally bumpable or is going to be long, hard work. We're now looking into the future. We're now looking at what, what if, what if we spend a million? What would happen if we spent it on these people near the wall? We also found there were some markets or some, certainly in our data, where there were kind of a, 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 a Twin Peaks kind of situation, a, a bipolar pump situation, a bump situation as we call it, where you might find that you've got a kind of polarized market where there's just a whole lot of people who will never, ever, if you spend a squillion dollars, will never come close to the Berlin Wall. So you identify those people and say to the market, Note the marketer, do not spend on these people. Meanwhile, you've got another group of people right near the wall. Identify them and work out what to do. Now, most market research doesn't give data in such clear terms, <coughs> whereas neural network really does. It, it boils everything down into a, into a simple line like that. And so we can play what if. In fact, what we could do with the neural network data is we could then take a variable and dial up the numbers and then run the algorithm again and see what happened. So for example, with energy drinks, we examined what would happen if they got a job or if they suddenly lost interest in nightclubbing or if they suddenly rated brand Z as particularly cool. And the cool thing about neural networks is it doesn't work in that regression thing of everybody moves half a step to the left or the right. Basically it showed that when uh, students got a job, some, uh, some people now bumped out of energy drink land. Maybe they've got serious, I've got money and I've got, you know, I'm employed and party days are over for me. So I'm out of, I'm out of energy drinks. Meanwhile, another group of people bumped into energy drinks. So we had these sort of cross currents running in the data. Um, these people didn't mind so much because now they had money, they just wanted to try the stuff. So you've got very complex pictures and stories emerging out of the simple bump analysis. You've really been given the suspects and being told, right, look at these people, look at those people. And it's arrived at those, those groups in a very complex way, but allows you to do simple things with it and actually play what if, you know, dialing up the interest in nightclub or dialing down the the, the economy or whatever we wanted to do. And we could keep doing it with past data. So what are the things I've learned from this approach? Well, it tells us which variables are driving the activation. It usually reveals that what if happens, there are two or more countervailing trends. Some people tune in, some people tune out. And by delivering us a, a bump as a kind of meta measure, uh, the bump index, we can still think in simple terms even though the raw materials here, even though the neural network has gone through all these zillions of iterations, it's, it's given it to us in a very simple graphical picture, bump index, one simple curve and then we can work from there. So summary, well this whole thing is about moving us to the top right, being more advanced in our analytics, getting into the world of modeling and taking our clients with us and saying, guys, we, we stop monitoring what happened last year and start playing what if with what you could be doing next year. What a cool thing that is. Um, in Arkley's heel in our research is our ability to model the future. We're not actually very good at it. In a, in a number of conferences and situations where I've asked, guys, how many of us are using neural networks or, 
or at-risk modeling or you know these sorts of tools, a forest of like one or two hands goes up. It's it's a it's a dwindling resource it seems. Neural networks helps us quite easily work with that rich multivariate curvy linear nature of forecasting, and and bump apart from being a cool little measure shows us that other outer frontiers of research value can be reached and communicated actually quite simply. Well, have you got any questions?